Hawaiian Airlines taking off right behind me, so we might do another intro right now. Good morning, afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from on this one year anniversary 12th episode of Tales of a Frigate Bird. You all know who I am. My name is Dan Campbell. I'm from Australia. I live in Hawaii. I am on Oahu, standing on Sand Island. And for this episode, well, we're going to chase big waves on the North Shore, small waves on the South Shore in Waikiki, and the infamous bonefish. And they swim in the waters right here. And we're going to spend the next three or four days chasing them down with the fly rod. I can't wait to get into it. I wish I could fly the drone here, but I'm restricted to the uh, airspace because my little airport is right behind me. But what a cool place to be standing. This is the local canoe club, and this is where those little buggers hang out. So, fingers crossed we get on. It's going to take a lot of walking up and down this beach early in the morning, looking for them finning. But let's get straight frickin' into it. Woohoo! Do this. I know this guy. Yes. It's a fishing channel. It is. What are we fishing for today? Well, have ones? a look behind you. <laughs> I'm a married man. I know. That's why I'm here. I lost my wedding ring at YMA Bay. Oh no. Yeah. I did Big that. One, I did that three days in. What? How did Jamie go? Uh, dude, he got a nice back door. Seventeen point six. Australian. He needed another Aubrey. like seventeen or didn't get it. Oh, really? All right, though. Has he bumped? No. I don't know. He, he usually takes the loss pretty good, dude, I'll be yeah. honest. He does, doesn't he? That I've been living here for uh, over 40 years, and you're gonna see exactly why I live where I live. This big house here is where Chris Lass and the, the artist lives during the winter months. And this is why I live where I live. Sunset Beach in all its glory. Today it's uh, kind of a diminishing swell. It was really big yesterday, going down a little bit today. The guys are all out practicing for the upcoming events for the winter. And uh, the swell's starting to clean up a little bit. So out here to the right at Sunset Point, right in the middle where the guys are riding the waves. You can see them on the waves up there. That's, that's Sunset Popper. And it's pretty much the one place I always wanted to live because, like I said, I lived in Haleiwa, I lived in Lani Kea, I lived in Cabela Bay, I went up and down the North Shore, and I always ended up at Sunset. So to be able to live here and surf here, couldn't ask for anything more. They're all guys from the 70s, you know, Parrish, uh, McCoy, Glenn Pang, Lopez, Ipa, 
You know, it's these are all ones from shortboard eras, and then these guys are more longboard eras from the '60s. You got, you know, Duconamokus, Mortys, all this is all Gordon Smith. This is all Bing's here. This whole section here is Hovies, and like these right here, these Dick Brewer models. I've done a bunch of these, and these are were like the Ferrari of their day. I mean, back in the '60s, if you had a Dick Brewer model Hovie gun, it was like, oh, that was the king. And then Phil Edwards, of course, was the first surfer to ever win the surfer pole, and done those surfboards in Hawaii. This is Dick Brewer's early label before he established himself, and then. Greg Knoll, the, the bull, of course, he's really well known for making big boards in the 60s. So all these labels in the 60s, one of the neat things is I've been able to bring back from the dead an old beat-up board, resurrect it, and it's, uh, it's really self-satisfying to take something that was in its prime and then has seen better days and then bring it back to life. So I'll actually, I'll show you one that I'm working on. Gonna be a real man to ride these things. <laughs> oh my god, I hope this rack will hold it. Oh, this thing's sucking heavy. What are you gonna do with that one? No, I'm gonna bring pull it down in a second. No, but you're restoring it for someone? Yeah, I sold it for sixty five hundred bucks. <laughs> so that's why I wanna Okay, that's okay. So Okay, rolling. Yeah, one sec. Get focus there. Okay. Okay, so when it comes to restoring old boards, there's three things: there's repair, refurbish, and restore. Kind of like think about a car when you fight in a car, and the paint's peeling, the upholstery's ripped, and the engine's blown up. You know, it's an original car, but it's in terrible condition. So how much would you pay for that? And some people say, leave them all original, don't touch them, but very the same with surfboards. You find surfboards that have been cooked in the sun, they've been dinged up, waterlogged. They're still original, but what are they going to be worth? So my job is to take these dead boards and bring them back to life, and that's what I specialize in. And a good example here is this board here. You can see it's all falling apart, delaminated and broken. You can see all these water stains. and. But what's neat about this, the label right here is this was a Mike Hinson who was one of the stars of the original Endless Summer shaped big wave gun and they only made eight of these and these boards were really considered like the Lamborghinis of the 60s. They were really sleek, really sexy and they were designed purely to surf the North Shore. So this thing is 10 foot 6 long you have these big redwood stringers, and you can see the pin, pintail shape. It was designed to ride big waves. But it's in a horrible, terrible condition, and this is what I find them like. But when I, what I do is I take them apart, glue them back together, and as a shaper, I've shaped about 15,000 surfboards in the last 30, 40 years. I know what it is to clean them up, so we take a skin, just little, just, you don't want to change the shape, you just want to clean it up and make it look good so it looks white again. And I have one that I completed that's the same version of this, of eight boards made, I actually found two of them. And uh, I'm in the process of restoring this one, but I'm going to show you one that I just finished up. And I'll put this one down. And we'll... <coughs> so basically we're going from this. this. So the exact same model board, completely redone, and it's back to life. And this board is a Mike Hinson model, Gordon Smith, full pintail gun. And this is the board that Mike the, the design that Mike wrote in the 1965 Duke Kahanamoku Invitational right out here at Sunset Beach. And there's only eight of these that were made and only four known left in existence. So the value of this board went from looking like what it, that is what it looked like when I started to completely redone now. So it's in like new condition. But it still has the patina of an old board and the look of an old board. But it's completely been rebuilt. And this is now worth thousands of dollars. I think it still rides the same? 
Yeah, I'd be a, a beast. <laughs> 35 pounds. And, uh, you know, I, 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 let me flip it over real quick. I mean, I love the template of this thing, but, you know, it's so sleek and it's such a, a race car looking thing. But you can see this, the, the bowl and the nose here. This is like a boat nose where they really rolled the nose out. And the idea was like a boat, so it, it pushed through the, the waves and pushed through the water. So you took off on this thing, you set your line, and you went, and that was it. But these were considered, like I said, the race cars of the, of the air. And here's one that's been completely restored, so it's gone from that to this, and, uh, and now it's something that people can enjoy and appreciate what it was. And this is what I do, so when I'm not out there uh, surfing, no longer running the contest, I get to get in here and have fun bringing uh, the history back to, to life again. <laughs> oh, look at that wife. Pumping. Are you ready? <laughs> My kick key.
Look at this spot. I am on Oahu and for the week and I want to chase some bonefish. Fly rod in hand, stopped off at Nervous Waters, picked up the five best flies that he had and I'm going to try my luck. I really, really, really hope I can catch a bonefish, the elusive bonefish here on Oahu. I know where to go, I think, um, but let's get straight into it. Woohoo! Start somewhere. Seeing anything but wrong tide, high tide, it's too bad. Well, that was a pretty epic spot. I didn't see anything. Um, a lot of little bait fish in there. But uh, maybe the tide's a little bit high right now. Um, I'll come back and try when the tide's lower. But we are just sightseeing for bonefish. So it's called finning. And you can just see there, top fin come out of the water. And I was hoping to see one. And that basically the whole idea is when you're looking for a bonefish in their finning, uh, you want to get the fly right in front of them. So you don't want the fly line or the fly to, to scare them off. So you set it in front of them. Um, and then when they get close enough, you give it that one little twitch. And if they go for it, you give it another little twitch. And then bam, you get lucky. But we're going to keep trying. We're on the east side of Oahu. I'm going to drive up to Turtle Bay. Pipeline, the Vans Pipe Masters uh, is on for the final day today. Um, so I'm going to go and check it out with a couple of mates. Maybe take a couple of photos. See who's going to win. That's, uh, I think they're calling for eight to 10 foot pipeline um, by lunchtime. So 
fingers crossed it's going to be epic. I really hope so. All right, let's head north. What a place. Look at this place. Oh, huh. Jeez, I love Oahu. sink very far because you're only in you know eight inches ten inches of water anyway yeah so the flies can be lighter weighted and you know more solid oh, right wow. so that's that kind of situation if right. you're going to fish a little deeper water then you want flies that are going to be a little heavier that are going to get down quicker so they have bigger heavy rods on them and so that's more for let's say knee deep water and so when, when you when you flip when i flip this out or this out mm -hmm. Am I letting them, am I putting it in front of the fish and well, waiting? Ahead, well ahead of the fish. Well ahead of the at fish. At least 10, 12 feet out in front of the fish. That gives the fly time to hit the water, the ripples to disperse, the fly to sink to the bottom before the fish knows anything's happening. And then... If you put it closer, it'll hear it land or see it sinking and run away. So you got to put it well in front, let the fly settle down so that the fish doesn't see anything that's going on when he makes his way over there in his own sweet time. Then just give it a little twitch, nothing fast, nothing sharp, and then that jumps it off the bottom, just a little twitch to crawl mm -hmm. along the bottom and see if there's a reaction. That's so if important. If it turns to it, like it noticed it, let him eat it. If it no. kind of didn't really notice it or it turned, but it didn't seem like it had any idea of exactly where the fly was, then you know, you wait a beat, then another twitch, and when it sees it, it should accelerate over, and then when it comes to a hard stop or the head dips or there's mm -hmm. a little wiggle, those are all signs that it ate the fly, 
do the next little strip, but maybe a touch longer till you tighten up. And if you feel tension, then it's then you're hooked up and it's time to let the line slide because you're not going to strip this thing in. If you set too hard, like it's a tarpon, right. or if you don't let go of the line with a death grip, you're just going to snap the tip. In. So my, my cousin lives in Port Myers. We go tarpon fishing. Right. And yeah, I lose all of those. <laughs> well, it's a different thing when you set too hard and you just snap the fish off. Right. right. It looks set. It's very disappointing. So yeah. no, try not to do that. So it's just the next little pull till you feel tension. And then when it starts to take off, then you let the line slide. Okay. And clear it. Hello. Next one. Okay. So maybe 10 one, we get with a little brown one. And, oh, if yeah. and if we're gonna spend some time in shallow, then you have that little guy. But this one again has smaller right. red eyes. And these are all sight fishing fly, because I'm assuming that's what you're gonna want to do in this mm -hmm. time. And then maybe the last one will go with something with bigger, heavier red still. So in case you end up in more of the knee deep water, thigh deep water, right. um, because you're not seeing shallow, then that's something heavier to throw. And that's should round it up. One of my friends, he wanted to take me, but he wanted to go at night, and I just, I can't film it. It's just too hard for me to even try and film at night. So I mean, it, to me, the most fun part of this fishing is the visual aspect of it. Visual. So that's why we go in the daytime. And people ask, you know, when do you want to go? Like they're thinking, so sometimes mornings or evenings right. can have the fish tailing more. Um, but usually we want to go more in the midday high sun hours because that's when we can clearly see it. Oh. Because even if they're tailing, if I can't figure out which way it's going, then it's kind of a blind guess anyway. Whereas if I see him swimming around, I see that green oblong fish moving around, then I can gauge where I think he's going to go, and that's where I'm going to throw the fly. If it's just a guess, then it's kind of blind casting. It's um, not as fun to me. I love it. I mean, the fly fishing aspect of this whole show, like I can, Kawhi, I just go out five miles and catch an and you know, then like all day long. Sure. The fly fishing has been, I, I was a, an athlete, a, a professional kayaker, and I kayak rivers all over the world, the Congo, the Zambezi, um, you name it, I've been there. And like the Zambezi has like, a, my friend has a, a tiger, tiger fish camp on the Zambezi. And when you get one of those on the fly, yep. it is on. <laughs> 25 pound sure, sure. tiger fish. I've seen some videos, yep. Yeah. Things go crazy with the teeth. Baruti Tiger pa uh, Camp is the, is the name of the place, and it's it's right up on the Zambezi. You just, it's amazing. But even like on the on the part of the Zambezi where we raft Victoria Falls through Rapid 18 or 26, Rapid number nine is like a class six rapid, and the fish have a really hard time getting up it. And you can kayak down to it, and you, and you Fly fish there, it. and you nail huge tiger fish in like tons of current. Like, yeah, pretty amazing. Okay, well, I've got until Thursday afternoon to catch. Um, do you have a couple of just leaders that like I've got? I've got like four reels. Okay, sure. Just a couple of leaders that you recommend, and where. So this one's a letter you use as both, and that's if you're going to fish the tailing fish up shallow, like okay. we talked about, or if you're going to fish near the coral where you're more likely to get cut off, then you pop it up to time. Okay. Dude, this is so exciting. I love it. I mean, I'm going to put everything into it. I am. <laughs> get some bone fish. Scoping the beach into the road and any. Ho ho! Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. It's the 2nd of January. I am back on the island of Kauai. I could not catch a bonefish to save my life on Oahu. It sucks, um, but that's fishing, right? So, I'm not gonna give up. You all know, 8.30 on the 15th, my episodes air. And so I have 13 days to try and catch a bonefish. I really wanna catch it on the fly rod. If I have to, I'm gonna go regular rod with octopus, but we have 13 days to do this. This is the world famous Anini Beach. It's absolutely gorgeous right now. We're at the bottom of the tide, so not really biting. So we want a rising tide. We've got good weather in the forecast. There's lots of waves. So I'm gonna come every day and give it my best shot to catch a bonefish and start 2024 off with a bang. Thank you for following along. I really appreciate it. What a crazy cool year 2023 was. Epic, 12 episodes of Tales of Frigate Bird. I am just loving it. This is so cool. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna give it one more year and see where we go from here. Some ideas, I wanna go back to the Zambezi, to the Baruti Tiger Camp, 
back down to New Zealand to see my sister, hopefully mum and dad in Australia. But let's catch some freaking bonefish already. All right, episode 12 and we are out. Flowers 